let's get set for the next great big Digibarn episode here in the Levity Zone. The Digibarn does Apple at 30. Ten years ago, in November 2006, yours truly, Dr. Bruce, and his Digibarn Computer Museum hosted the biggest commemoration of Apple's 30th birthday as a special event of the Vintage Computer Festival held at the brand new location for the Computer History Museum in Mountain View, California. To celebrate Apple's upcoming 40th birthday on April 1st, 2016, we bring you this celebration of its 30th birthday way back in the days before the iPhone and before Apple became the world's most valuable company. For this event, I recruited four excellent panelists, with the one condition that each of them had to have worked in the original garage at Steve Jobs' parents' house in which Apple Computer got its start. First up, we hear from Steve Wozniak, or The Woz, He is Apple's co-founder and the technical and prankster brains behind the company. Then we hear from Randy Wigginton, who met Woz at the Homebrew Computer Club and went on to a great career working on the Apple I, Apple II, and Macintosh. Next up is Chris Espinoza, who started at Apple when he was just 14 years old, getting in trouble from his parents for being up all night writing Apple I basic demo programs for Woz. Chris is still at Apple after 40 years. And finally, we'll hear from Daniel Kotke, who started assembling Apple Ones in the garage and went on to work on the Apple II, III, and Macintosh. Daniel has been a personal friend for almost 20 years and helped us get the Digibarn started. I invite you to look up each of these fine gentlemen on Wikipedia for more detailed bios. Following my introduction of the topic, the unique and inventive soup that was being cooked up in Silicon Valley back in the mid-70s, the four panelists held forth. My apologies for the rather echoey sound quality of the recording but I can say it's worth sticking with, as you will hear never-before-synthesized early history of Apple, and part of the story of how the digital lifestyle we are surrounded by today was born. For me personally, what shines forth here is what a good fellow was, was, and is. Generous to a T, gifted but also humble, and really, really funny. I would like to thank Waz for his years of support of me and the Digibarn project and for being a friend in the neighborhood. And welcome. We're now at Apple at 30. And uh, just going to give you a really brief a slideshow to kind of put you back into those days if it's possible. And then the panelists are going to take you really back in the time machine. And when I think about the events that we've done in the last few years from the Alto event on up to the homebrew event and whatnot, what emerges is this kind of soup, this kind of milieu of what was going on in the mid-70s. And I was a nerd kid in the mid-70s from Canada, if you can't tell. You might have thought I was Minnesotan, but no. I'm from the great pink north. Um, in the spring of 75, I went to Sunnyvale, but I didn't know this was going on. But I kind of picked up on the, the vibe that was in the Bay Area in the mid-70s and I said to myself when I was a 13-year-old kid, you know, not much older than a couple of you guys, that I wanted to come back and live here, and that's how I ended up coming back and living here. But, of course, any of us who were in school and whatnot in that period, and even if we were in the hinterlands like me, you got the personal computers eventually. Eventually it came and trickled down to you. But um, I'm just going to give you an idea of this soup, and I think of it as a kind of a baking exercise. We'll go to the next slide. So you want to cook up an industry? It's easy. Just follow this convenient recipe. First, see, I've got good ingredients, ingrediments. So, ingrediments. What do you need to cook up an incredible gourmet dish to create an industry? Well, you need extraordinary people. Too many people to list that were involved in this industry, of course, but some people we have here today were some of those extraordinary people. You need inspiring places. Well, Homestead High in the lower left. That's Homestead High in 1974, folks. 
without all the fancy media centers that it has now, but maybe it had the big swimming pool. And extraordinary places, Hewlett Packard, there's HP 35, extraordinary machine, extraordinary people, extraordinary place. Atari, we all know what an impact that had. It was kind of in a way a bridge from the big company like HP into the, into the world of people using computers. And uh, there's another extraordinary place, that's the garage in Los Altos, that's the Jobs Family Garage. Extraordinary place. And you had deeply felt nerdly passions. There's a, a little screenshot of Lee Felsenstein last year waving his yardstick at the uh, homebrew club. Uh, and you had down there, this is an excerpt from Rich Today's uh, Finite State Fantasies. It's the cartoon about a kid who's building his homebrew kit. Anyway, so that's, that's uh, ingredients. Next slide. You need recipes. Well, uh, one of the great early recipes was Build a TV Typewriter by Don Lancaster. I know Waz will be able to explain about this, and I think Daniel will be able to comment a little bit about, gee, what happens when you combine the TV Typewriter recipe with the Altair recipe? What comes out of that? So these are excerpts from Homebrew Computer Club newsletters that we collected last year, and you can see uh, Waz is building a TV Typewriter of his own design. Randy Wigginton is trying to get an Altair 8800 to play games. I don't know if that happened. Anyway, so recipes, you gotta have them. And, and they were floating around. Next slide. Kitchens, when we talked about the garages, there are very few pictures I could find of sort of inside garages, but I found this out from a Fortune Magazine article. There's Steve Jobs standing in front of the garage, and that's sometime in the 80s. And then this is supposedly a picture inside the garage in 76. Um, this is purportedly a picture of uh, Waz's workbench in 76, and maybe you can verify if that's a, a reconstruction or is it the real thing. Uh, anyway, there we have it. Uh, next picture. And you, of course, have to have chefs if you're going to make a, a fine dish. And here's the various collection of pictures of our chefs then and now. And I think the one that, that's sort of most endearing, I think, is the number 26 there with Waz with the actual blue box in it. It's colored blue, in fact. It must have been the blue box. And uh, if you see the one in the lower center, that's at the West Coast Computer Fair. Uh, and there's a whole series of pictures taken by Tom Munnicky, who sent them to me. Uh, anyway, and then in the upper right there, there's Steve Jobs this year uh, doing a, a commemoration of the 30th event at Macworld in the spring. Anyway, uh, just a great collection of then and now of the chefs. So next slide. And cooking it up. Very few of these around. It took me a long time to find on the net an actual Apple One schematic, but there it is. Uh, next slide. And hot out of the oven, Apple One. This is a photo from Salam. And I'm always curious as to why it says Apple Computer One Palo Alto, California. Did Palo Alto have much to do with it? I'm not sure. Sort of the neighboring communities? Mailing address. Mailing address. Oh. Answering service was there. Answering service was there. Okay. There we go. Solved. Okay, uh, next slide. And this, as I spoke about earlier, at the serving of the Apple, the first public show, and there's Daniel Kotke and Steve Jobs in Atlanta City, New Jersey, on August 28, 1976. And you can just sort of see a little computer in the right on that, that's a little placard there, and perhaps that's marketing literature or tech specs behind them. But that's a great, great photo there. And the great Apple computer logo, which I'm sure the panelists will explain where that comes from. So it's such a beautiful piece of art. And next slide. What's interesting about this, although the, the projector's munging this a little bit, is when you look at this first literature, this first sort of spec sheet or ad for the Apple One, it really looks like an Apple ad of today. It's got that Times Roman font on the top and very clear explanations. And, you know, it's just, it's Apple. Apple's had that consistency all these 30 years. And price is $666.66, and I'm sure the guys will explain, that, is this indeed the mark of the beast? <laughs> Which I don't think it was. I think it was just repeating numbers were easier to remember. Anyway, we're basically going to turn off a projector, let the panel set up here and just start to talk. And after a certain amount of time, what well, seems to make sense, we'll open it up for a story period. If anyone has a story, keep it under two minutes to blurt out. I know Crunch has a story. He will blurt that out and for all to, uh, to enjoy. And we'll do some kind of mapping or random access with anybody else could stand up. This is Lee Felsenstein homebrew club term. 
say anything that you want to connect with other people, say around the Apple history. And we're really looking for people who have pictures and video and anything that we can scan in for artifacts for our pages to offer to the world under our Creative Commons license about Apple's early history. There isn't a whole lot on the web, and there needs to be more photo albums of slides or whatever, or pictures of things at Apple in 76, 77, or anything. There's a bunch of us that want to scan those in. If you're okay, then being offered for non-commercial use off the DigiBarn pages. This is why I do these events, to gather more cyber archives. We're going to do the lovely cake cutting. This year we have uh, Apple at 30, this logo on the cake. Uh, great cake, thank you, Safeway. People will mill about and general confusion will prevail. And at 9 p.m., Waz will finally finish talking to people and signing their IWAS books and Apple II covers. Uh, thanks to people who helped, the speakers, etc., and also to Jeff Raskin, who many of you knew. This is uh, one of the last pictures that I took of Jeff, and one of the last things that he did to benefit me is to show me the Apple one that Steve Wozniak gave him. And uh, it's sitting right up here. Thank you, Linda. Uh, don't forget the shameless plug. Digibarn Computer Museum, we're up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Nerd buys farm eight years ago. Nerd walking around farm notices there's a 5,000 square foot barn there. They didn't notice before. What does nerd do with barn? <laughs> Wife loves pigs. So pot belly pigs go in the outside horse stalls. Nerd walking around on the inside of barn says, I could store old computer junk in here. <laughs> Hence the beginning of Digibarn. Nerd goes over to Xerox Park for last demo of Xerox Star and says, this can't be the last demo of a Xerox Star. Nerd finds all old Xerox hardware to assemble and get working to continue the Xerox story and then discovers you've got to tell everything else, too. So there's now about 400, 450 systems there, crazy supercomputers down to little itty-bitty things, and uh, it's all a community-based project. You can boot up the artifacts. The whole Digibarn is meant as a story capture mechanism. The main focus I have is getting your stories onto the site for perpetuity. Because when the people are gone, the artifacts will still be well preserved somewhere and the people won't be there to tell the stories. So that's what I'm mainly focused on. So anyway, visit digibarn.com. Three o'clock tomorrow down in the lobby. I'll hand out maps and we'll lead the group over to the museum. And uh, now, who's got the pipe? I'll start. Um... It's, yeah, it's so great to be here with this group because <coughs> I often speak about how all this excitement that we had going in the Hoover Computer Club and the early days of talking about how we were going to revolutionize society with technology and all I was good at was being a good technologist and a very shy one. But we had exciting people around. I don't like to think about, well, I'm going to design something for all these millions of people in the world to write a book. I like to think about the people that I'm like hands-on touching, talking with every day. And, you know, you roll off an idea. What if a computer was like this? I get an idea. I want to show it off. It's really to the close people. And, uh, Chris and Randy were so young back in those days. And Daniel's very young. Came along just a little later after the, uh, we got started with the Apple One. And it was just those sort of people that you talk off and you feel your ideas have some value and merit in the world. And there's other people saying, wow, what a great product. This is really going to, you know, help change the world. So it's good to be here with this group. And you're still shy. And, um... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still and I'm still very shy in uh, like most social situations. <laughs> um, yeah, it is great to uh, be here. Uh, I look back on it and it's just so many uh, uh, great memories. We had Waz uh, uh, and I had so much fun. Uh, Bob's a big boy. Um, the soft hair and uh, floppy disk. Yep, going out all night long, uh, working and gambling and alternating shifts. That was fun. And uh, it's just uh, been one of the pleasures of my life to uh, be associated with uh, Apple and Steve and Chris and Daniel and everybody else. And although Steve and I were in our young 20s, Randy was still in high school when we met him. Chris was very young in high school. But these guys were like so young that their minds were open and they spotted, whoa, the sort of thing that Waz is doing, you know, just a certain number of chips that you can actually count on a board is a whole computer right to a programming language. Uh, it was just so inspiring. The young people would see it and get interested. They had that energy that kind of pushes you, you know, wow, let's try this. Why don't we do this? Why don't we, you know, a lot of that movement there. Um, so it's kind of nice to be with them. And Chris, God, I remember the, the night you stayed at Apple writing some software demos and you got in a lot of trouble. I never even thought about it myself. Yeah, um, thanks, Plus. Uh It was really interesting being um, 
14, 15 years old and having as my hobby uh, hanging out with guys who would turn out to have been the founders of a major technical revolution and an entire industry that transformed certainly our way of life around here and not just around uh, or, and around the world. Uh, but coming home at 6 in the morning uh, after staying out all night and getting uh, put on suspension by your parents uh, is you know, a common experience for a lot of kids, but um, very few did it uh, writing uh, graphic self-foot subroutines with WASP. <laughs> and that was, I think, the only suspension I got when I was in high school. But uh, it was, I really didn't know, and I don't think uh, uh, Randy did either, that this wasn't the way that 14-year-olds you know, did things when they were in high school. You got a hobby, you found some friends, they started a small business. I mean, I was in junior achievement. That's what they were telling me was going to happen. You start a small company and it grows. Well, I've been there 30 years now. Um, uh, the reason I'm there is that in 1981, I'd gone off to college uh, to get a uh, degree in English literature because everybody told me that I wouldn't get a good job unless I had a, a college degree. I, I saw Waz and Jobs and they were both dropouts and I didn't want to end up like them. Uh, <laughs> and so Jobs called me up one day and said, I want you to come be the publications manager for Macintosh. Listening carefully, it will only take a year. <laughs> And I'll pay your tuition to finish college when we're done. Um, I'm still waiting. <laughs> uh, it was nice to see also um, uh, Liza's uh, um, demonstration of well, the first half of one um, that was up on the projector. And I remember that so deeply. It was a way that um, I felt like she was doing stuff, taking around, rolling around a PP11 or something to schools and showing fourth graders how computer software is a set of steps written by humans. And I thought, wow, how great could I contribute to technology and to young kids' education? So I actually donated the first Apple One to her, and then Steve Jobs came and made me pay 300 bucks for it. That was my partner. <laughs> so it wasn't that easy. But, um, um, you know, it was great because uh, uh, we went up to the PC76 show. And we had a picture up there of Steve Jobs with Daniel Pocky, who I'll pass the mic to. And I was actually in a room in the hotel, working away, trying to finish up basics so I could be like uh, Bill Gates. <laughs> well, it's uh, pretty surrealistic to be here 30 years later. Um, you know, uh, my history was I grew up in Palm New York in a high school that had no electronics. It wasn't even a radio shack in town. I remember trying to build a walkie-talkie kit in high school and just had, did not know anyone else who was interested at all. And so my interest in electronics just completely faded. And uh, I became a friend with Steve Jobs at college at Reed over Eastern literature. And Steve never talked about the Blue Box activities that he was doing with the laws. Never talked about it at all, which surprised me later. Because I would have been interested. And he never talked about electronics at all. Uh, and so then, uh, summer of 76, I came out to visit, not for any particular reason, but Steve was already doing the Apple One. So uh, I can clearly remember my first day I arrived at the job's house. Uh, Steve's younger sister, Patty, was in the living room watching television. She was watching the gong show, in fact, and plugging the chips into the Apple One on the coffee table. So actually, it was the coffee table stage in the living room. Uh, and I thought, well, God, I could do that. And uh, so then I took over that job right away. Like, <laughs> I wasn't really into the gong show, but I was really interested in electronics. Didn't, didn't, did not have a clue how that stuff worked. So I spent a good deal of that summer uh, reading Interface Age magazine and reading the 6502 instruction manual, which I could not make any sense out of. But um, I tried. Well, Dan was hitting on a subject too, which is the Grog. Well, Grog was a uh, uh, nover from with Hewlett and Packard starting their garage and they had their own company there. But really, we didn't have a telephone in the garage. Steve ran the business from his bedroom, you know, and from the other parts of the house, calling distributors, calling magazines, calling parts suppliers, and all the engineering that was done in my cubicle at HP or my apartment. And 
The garage, though, was so close to our hearts because it was the place that we brought people. We had one lab bench set up and we could plug the computers together and do a final test before we drove them down to the store to get paid cash. But we'd bring people in and give the demos and talk there. And it was like sort of like the, a nice warm place to meet people because it had a little bit of space and the rest of the house was always kind of crowded. Um, let's see. Uh, I first started working in the garage in um, December of 76. Uh, I met Waz and Jobs at the Homebrew Computer Club. Uh, our mutual teachers at Homestead High School, uh, Steve Headley on the uh, computer side, and uh, John McCullough on the electronic side, who um, always spoke very highly of you, Waz, and not so much of Steve. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, warned me to, to keep my distance from the both of you, but thought it would be okay if I learned a little from you because you'd have actually gotten jobs, which was good. Um, and so after um, learning to program the Apple One at uh, the bike shop in Palo Alto, where they, they paid me handsomely in uh, two Michael magazines. magazines for writing, for demo, writing programs. demo programs. Uh, I ran into jobs one day there, and he said, would you like to come test the ROM software in the Apple II before we ship it? And so I spent my um, my December break uh, my, of uh, my sophomore year in high school sitting in the garage, which didn't have heat that I recall, uh, <laughs> testing uh, integer basic before you burned it into the Apple II ROM. And that was when I started first working in the garage. Yes, I do remember those quotes then. Um, also, a lot of people present like, oh, I can't design the Apple I computer. And actually, that's sort of a phony concept because um, even without seeing Pop Electronics, not knowing anything about an Altair computer on the cover of Pop Electronics, not knowing anything about a TVT designed by anyone else, I had visited John Gray for Kent and Crunch in a garage once, he's typing on a teletype, saying, I'm talking to a machine in Boston, and I can switch to other computers in Berkeley and Stanford, and it was the ARPANET, forerunner of the internet, and I just looked at it and said, I've got to have that, and the only way to have things was to build them out of parts virtually for free in my own design, and use my home TV, so I built the little terminal first. And in those days, I optimized everything so tightly um, that the fastest modems that you could get would go 300 baud, that's 30 characters a second. So in trying to optimize my terminal, I designed it to do 60 characters a second, more than any terminal could do, more than any modem in the day could do, more than any teletype could do. So it was plenty fast, but by doing that, I was able to have little cheaper parts. And to me, everything in design was fewer parts or cheaper parts, with cheaper winning. And the cheapest parts were some little serial dynamic RAMs to hold the memory that was on your screen, the characters that were on your screen. So I had this terminal already. Then the idea came, why don't I group it together instead of calling a computer in Boston, call a little microprocessor and some RAM right here and a little program I write, and then and then I'll have a computer. So it was a, a little humble together out of a video terminal designed for one characteristics to build the computer. So you look at this computer and say, whoa, all it does is kind of print characters sort of slowly, only 60 a second. You know, um, it's not that impressive. Well, it wasn't really designed from the ground up to be a computer that had an intelligence, a processor, and a video. So uh, that's one of the reasons the Apple I is, was kind of hobbled together. The Apple II was really the first computer designed from the ground up, but it wasn't even designed to be a computer. It just started designing it as a color TV generator and then used the signals to drive the computer. Do you want to uh, talk about Paul Computer, Randy? Oh, yeah. another thing we did today? Well, um, Apple II actually was Paul of Waz's law, right? That's one of the first things you ever taught them. Do it right the second time. <laughs> better, <laughs> look better. No, you said do it right. Did you teach me wrong? Um, Paul Computer is actually um, was a uh, time-sharing outfit that was uh, just a couple just a couple blocks from here, actually. Old Middlefield. On uh, Old Middlefield Road. Yeah. And uh, they contacted you to uh, design a kernel. Wasn't that uh, like a uh, kernel? No, no. Actually, I had built a journal on my own to do the ARPANET stuff, and then Steve Jobs came by and said, let's sell it. Right. He said, the college said, let's sell the blue boxes. And the terminals said, let's sell the terminals. And then we came to the Apple, he said, let's sell the computers. There you go. And uh, yeah, you can get into the Homebrew Computer Club on your, um, yeah. your call computer. And you wrote the assembler. Yes, I wrote the uh, original assembler for uh, the Apple II, and uh, I mean it was all running on uh, uh, time share computers back then, because nobody could afford a computer of our own, right? We all had to share a computer. Remember that? I mean, that, that, to me that's amazing that uh, back then, having your own computer was just virtually unheard of, so that's why I started going to the Homebrew Computer Club. 
and you were the first one that uh, really made computers that people could get other than out there. <laughs> and some people hung around me at the Computer Club saying, whoa, I can count the chips on this board. They're all cheap chips. How did you do it? But, you know, still, it was, a, it was sort of a subset because everybody was into the existing Altair, the, the uh, Intel chip computers of the day. Um, you know, we tried to be a, a little bit different, and really it was, uh, it was almost accidental. I'd already built my own, five years before, I built my own machine with eight little switches for binary data and buttons to load up address registers and memory, and that's what the Altair was. It had 256 bytes of memory when you bought it stock, and that's what I very good. Well, after five years, you kind of want to move on to something else, and really, working with Hewlett Packard was the biggest influence to try to make a computer more human, like with a keyboard that looks normal, looks like something people could understand and doesn't frighten the uh, novitiate away. And I look back, I didn't even think about it at the time, that it was all that important. It was just the cheaper, better way to do something was to build this thing with a little program that said, what are you typing on a keyboard? You could type in some commands that said, stuff this into memory, and it would happen. You didn't have to call the switches and push buttons and move it over. It's really because it was cheaper. And, uh, you know, I look back at every computer before the Apple One had a front panel. Every computer since has had a keyboard. So it was a big, um, a big important step. Yeah, uh, a lot of us uh, actually had experience outside of the Apple One and the Apple Two uh, before I met Woz and Jobs and started working exclusively on the Apple One and Apple Two. Um, my best friend had a Cosmac. I used the Kim One. I almost took a job working uh, for the people at Kim down on um, down in San Jose. But uh, Scott Scott Boulevard in Santa Clara was too far to commute for me. Uh, because I only had a bicycle, and so Apple was a much better job opportunity because it was a half a mile away instead of uh, five miles on the bike. Um, when uh, my computer class, and Steve Headley's class, finally got a budget to uh, invest in microcomputers, uh, I wanted, I got a lot of um, processor technology RAM cards and an S100 backplane and a uh, Fromemco color dazzler because they would pop for all of them, because all of the peripherals and the infrastructure and the, the ecosystem was all around the S100 bus. But I didn't know Intel machine code. Still don't even know we're shipping Intel machines now. Um, okay, I, I toggled in the color desert and strap on an altar at least once. Um, but, and ran, and uh, I, I also toggled in the, the um, I punched I, I have to admit it, I punched duplicate copies of all here basic. Bill Gates still hates me for that. <laughs> but I found this company that was building 6502 board, CPU boards for the S100 bus. And so I built this thing for high school, spent thousands of dollars of the high school's money on a 6502 based um, S100 bus machine with, with a um, punch tape, tape punch, punch and, and reader and. Uh, processor tech, memory processor tech board, never worked, never worked at all, and there was no software available for the 6502, um, except, except in the Apple ecosystem, and that's uh, where we were, with the incompatible processor for all of history. I completely forgot about Apple that was, the, that was actually the other first job I had that summer. Yeah, Alex I had, and Yes, uh, so I had come out in June of 76, and Steve was graciously trying to help me find work. There wasn't that much to do with the Apple One. And so he got me a job with Call Computer, We're working hourly for three fifty an hour, I think, assembling modems. And I didn't even know until later. I think you designed that modem. You yes. did not? Yes, I did not. But it, it was all ammo. Uh, a couple yeah, times. I don't take credit for designing. It was sort of out of the data sheet of, a, of one of the companies that made something. Yeah, so that, that, I, I didn't know anything about modems. I didn't know how it worked. I didn't know how to... It was all I could do to just learn the resistor code. The side of the gun. Uh, Alex was quite a character. Maybe that's an upset about that. <laughs> yeah. I, I also remember in our home for computer club, Randy was assigned the job of setting up a Tuesday night chat Chat X session for, it was free to all the Homebrew Computer Club members. Oh, yeah. So, and so I went on and I analyzed the program. It was written in basic, and it, as soon as it was, it, it always grabbed this file called Chat X that you would type into, and everybody else who was online would read what you had typed. So I just wrote a program to sit there, wait until Chat X was free, grab the file, and dump nine pages of Polish jokes into it. <laughs> Yeah, I got in trouble for you, I think, back then. Yeah. <laughs>
I remember at Apple, I got hired by uh, Steve Jobs for uh, three dollars an hour and for programming. And uh, the only way I finally made a raise is that I gave us a shortcut through to uh, 7-Eleven. Uh, Waz was tired of walking all the way around the fence, so I actually cut a hole through the fence. <laughs> Came in one day and found a bunch of boards on his desk, and uh, my pay rate went up after that. So when we started putting together the um, the Apple IIs, when we got our first building, uh, I remember like the, the night before we formally took possession, Waz and Randy and I went over there. Uh, there was no furniture in it. Half of the building was carpeted, and half the building was linoleum. The carpeted half was sales and marketing, and the linoleum part was engineering and manufacturing. Uh, and the only thing that was installed were the telephones. Now, when you're in a building with nothing but telephones in it, and Steve Wozniak, <laughs> You know that you know that you're going to have some fun, and basically we we played this game of tag, running around the room, buzzing each other on the the PBX system, and and trying to uh, buzz the phone that the other guy was on before he could buzz you back, and it was, you know like a a somewhat grown up game of electronic tag. Um, and then it got populated. There were lab benches, and there were desks, and there was Steve's desk, and there was um, uh, Dana Reddington's desk, and. What the hell happened to all those people? Then, you know, started getting the cases for the Apple II and getting ready for the first West Coast Computer Fair, and we hired Mike Scott, who was the president of the company, and uh, he decided that uh, having a uh, loose leaf report cover technical reference manual was inadequate, so one day he and um, uh, Sherry Livingston, I guess it was, gathered together everything that they could find out of anybody's, tech, anybody's desk drawer that looked technical and took it down to PIP printing and had it printed and bound, you know, uh, consistent or not, accurate or not, whatever, and that was the first uh, red book, the Apple II reference manual. Uh, and we had a lot of problems back in those days with, you know, simple manufacturing stuff, and there's a copy of it. I remember the Bernie sockets drove us nuts. Uh, you know, we almost didn't do socket and stuff. And yeah, Apple documentation never got any better. Oh, no, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one of my biggest problems with the original uh, Apple II keyboard was it extended about an inch beyond the, the lip of the case, so if you lifted yes. up the case too much, it would pop the keyboard right out of the case, right out of the screws. And the summer of 77, we had this huge problem with electrostatic discharge. Whenever you'd walk across the, yep. the uh, carpet, if you touched an open case of an Apple II, you fried the keyboard chip. Yep. And we were replacing keyboard chips all the time. Good, I'll get back to that one. We had, we had actually, um, our documentation for those days got you to understand the computer down to the lowest level of chips, and so many people like to learn from them. Um, I hear a lot of good stories from them. But, um, yeah, the Apple One originally, <coughs> he came back on quickly. I already had a video terminal that I designed and built. I wanted to provide a microprocessor with it, and these Intel microprocessors were rumored to be 400 bucks. You know, my apartment rental was 300, 400 bucks for a processor. I could never afford that. And then I found out I could get a, motor, a Motorola 6800 for $40 as a Hewlett Packard employee. So the board is actually designed and has the nomenclature for a 6800 chip. Then the MOS Technology 6502 came out for $20, 25 bucks. And it was pin for pin electrically compatible with the 6800 that I had done all of my drafting of the designs of the computer. So I said, whoa, I can use this one because it's easy to buy. I don't have to go down to a parts distributor that wants me to fill out all these forms like I'm a company with people who, you know, PO numbers and people who have officers in the company and all these credit reports that just don't apply to a normal person who has a $20 bill. I could go down to the Westmont show and pay a $20 bill over the counter and chuck that on itself and hand it back a nice 6502 microprocessor and five bucks for a manual and drove home up as soon as so exciting and easy to put that together that there were two chips, a 6501 and a 6502. The 6501, like the Motorola 1600, needed higher uh, power, faster clocking circuits built out of transistors with a little higher voltage and all that. And I still have the parts on the board since it was designed for a 1600 anyway. So you could actually plug in a few little transistors and resistors and all that, and a 6501 would save five bucks. But, um, you know, we went with the, uh, the better choice. Another good choice that we made was dynamic RAMs came out that year, 1960-75, and 
I'm at the Homebrew Computer Club, and first of all, the electronics magazines I'm reading feel accurate. The, the 4K dynamic RAM is the first time ever that silicon RAM is going to be cheaper than magnetic core memory. And you can see the future. All of a sudden, that is the right way to go. But every single one of the hobby computer kits being built, every single one bar none, used the 2104 static RAM. Four times more expensive, 2102, whatever it was. Four times more expensive, four times as many chips, and I was trying to reduce cost and reduce chips. And I guess they just didn't want to figure out how to design refresh circuits. You know, but to me, the office engineer, the goal was how to get design with the fewest parts. So I, I bought some, I bought, there were three companies that came out with the 4K dynamic RAM. AMI, some Texas company, either MOSFET or TI, and Intel. And Intel, of course, would be so expensive, forget it. I looked at all the data sheets and loved that Intel one. Oh, the chips were TTL compatible, they were fewer pins, smaller packages, and even though you had to put in a little bit extra circuitry to feed half the address and then the other half, it turns out that um, I measured circuit complexity by the number of pins, and the number of pins still wound up being less, so it was the better chip. But I couldn't afford anything from Intel, so I didn't even look that way. I bought at the club, I bought a AMI chip, probably from some employee of AMI, first I never ran, built in my refresh circuits and actually got it working on the Apple One. I could bring it down to the Homebrew Computer Club and demonstrate something that now only had eight chips for 4K of RAM. And that was another way to kind of impress people, because back then I couldn't talk to anyone unless they were impressed with my work. And uh, as funny as it sounds. So uh, anyway, Steve Jobs called up, what about the Intel one? I said, well, it's Intel, it'd be too expensive. He says, what if I can get it for free? Well, he could talk his way into anything, basically. <laughs> the rules, yeah, the rules didn't apply, <laughs> and he still can. And then he just called a rep, um, he told me, and, and got eight, got 16 chips of the Intel one. So we got on the right path for the RAMs that were really going to be the future of RAMs, the ones that were going to evolve over time. I recently ran to somebody who said, oh, actually, uh, Gordon Moore knew Steve's father and gave the RAM, so I don't know what the true story is. <laughs> Steve never quite lives on his sources of things like, like where did the name Apple come from and that sort of stuff. Uh, the, Apple, the Apple logo that was on the Apple One manual was drawn by Ron Wayne. When we started the company, Steve and I decided to have 45% each and give Ron Wayne, a fellow that Steve had met at Atari, 10% because Ron kind of had instant answers to everything. He was one of these arch conservative guys who read all these books like None Dare Call Trees. So he had instant answers to everything. I thought, wow, that's a good guy to answer any disputes between us. He's so smart. He could sit down with a typewriter and type out the legalese that only lawyers know, know with all the legal words. And uh, he drew the, he, he actually drew the, um, the etching on our Apple manual, at Newton Under the Apple Tree. Uh, he wrote the entire manual. And eventually, when we were getting parts of 30 days credit, building computers in the garage, driving them down to the store getting paid cash in 10 days. When we had 30 days credit on the parts, he got worried that if we ever didn't get paid, Steve had no money, no bank account, no car. I had no money, no bank account, no car. They'd have to come to him and get his gold nuggets or something. So he might have made a statistically an intelligent decision to sell out just 10% of Apple for a few hundred bucks. And that was Ron Wayne, and you know, I'm sure he doesn't regret it. I mean, you make a decision at the time that turned out wrong doesn't mean that they were the wrong decision. Well, I remember going over to Ron Wayne's house with Steve Jobs. He also was one of his two, his name is on the schematic. <laughs> what, so you had a hand-drawn schematic and he did a No, 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 no. I did hand-drawing and I did, I did the, um, the actual, I did the actual drafting of Bill Packard, drafting of all of our schematics, Apple 1, Apple 2. Sometimes they would get redone by other people later, maybe for a manual, but um, there wasn't any real reason for it. You know, Ron Wayne had another interesting talent, which was he was building pendulum clocks out of cardboard. Do you remember that? He had a kit to make clocks where every part of it was out of cardboard, which now that I think of it, reminds me of one of Jeff Raskin's songs. Well, it's that sort of thing about Ron Wayne that was so impressive that Steve and I did him as equal partner. He had all these little, you know, you could just about make anything out of nothing. The sort of, the sort of people that kind of surprise you with their abilities and talents. Speaking of surprising with their abilities and talents, I'll never forget driving up to Homebrew Computer Club with you early. Chris and I were the ones that had to carry the TV. Um, and uh, you would sit there before the meeting and type in uh, integer basic in hex. I mean, he would, he would literally be typing with one hand, turning the page with the other hand. You type it in for, uh, I guess, about an, an hour, something like that. And that was the origins of the uh, cassette interface. <laughs> 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 well, um, yeah, typing the basic and well, it's, um, one of the stories is all of the, I could not afford an assembler. There was an online assembler that you could dial in with a terminal and a modem, 
and you could actually um, you could actually type a 6502, a 7 megabit program in, and have it compile it and tell you what the ones and zeros were. Well, in my case, since I couldn't afford that, I just wrote the program on the right-hand side of a sheet of paper, and I hand-wrote the ones and zeros, the hexadecimal, on the left side, and sometimes you get wrong trying to guess. It's probably about 30 bytes ahead, so I'll put in hexadecimal for a jump of 30, and then I'll go back later and correct it, and um, wrote the entire thing, everything by hand, all the way up to every bit of code that's in the Apple II, was never run through an assembler by that point in time. So, which is kind of unusual. I look back and I still got those manuals, and um, the cassette tape interface saved me a lot of time because I would sit typing about 4K of basic in, and it would take me about 40 minutes during the Homebrew Computer Club meeting. So once I got it in, I could actually run basic. Don't ask me how I could type that accurately, that much data. But then designed the cassette tape interface to use a normal cassette tape. Just everything I had to use had to be virtually for free. I could never afford some kind of commercial tape unit like the Hewlett Packard would have gone with. And um, and so a little cassette tape, you know, all it did was put out the you know, pulses of different frequencies and measure what came back from the tape and it worked. And so it was almost a forerunner of the floppy disk interface. The uh, important thing about uh, Steve's cassette interface is that it only worked on cheap recorders. There was a Radio Shack model <laughs> that was on Apple, Apple recommended. And if you tried to use it on a good quality cassette recorder, it wouldn't work. But on the, uh, always going with cheap parts, in this case, only the cheap parts. <laughs> yeah, I never heard that, but I thought it worked. We sold a lot of Apple ones and Apple twos, even that thing came out originally with the cassette tape interface only. And boy, all the numbers of companies that spun up putting out tape, you walk into a store and there's an Apple two. And a whole ton of tapes of mostly games, but uh, it really made us look big. Like, you know, you see all these accessories for the iPod, it makes you look like a bigger part of the world and more substantial. Now, it took a lot of work to do that because um, in uh, early 77, uh, when we were you know, on a growth curve uh, shipping Apple ones and then Apple twos, uh, we didn't have a tape duplicator. And the way to duplicate the, was, the system software for the Apple II, which was the, the set of basic games we shipped, um, was a, a rack of Panasonic cassette tape machines all run off the same Apple II. And the way you do it is you type in the command to dump the program to tape. And somebody had designed this octopus um, audio splitter that went out of the cassette out jack and went to all of the tape. And then you had to press play and record on all of the tape machines simultaneously and then return on the keyboard. And anybody who had some spare moments and was available in the room was supposed to start and stop the tape duplication whenever they could. And when somebody would come in to talk to, um, you know, Mike Scott about like a $25 million line of credit at the Bank of America or, or opening up new distributorships or something like that, he would interrupt the meeting, go, go up, pop the tapes out, put in new blank tapes, start it up again, and go back and say, okay, now what we were saying. <laughs> and, and, and that was a kind of environment plus. There, it was, I, I don't want to say it was an ego-free environment because there were massive egos, but nobody had a pride investment in, I don't do that, that's not my job. Uh, everybody was pulling together and doing whatever it took to get stuff done, and people would do multiple jobs um, just to move the company forward. And it wasn't, it's not like they were moving the company forward. It was like moving the, the product forward, moving the Apple one, moving the Apple two forward. And it was just a, an, an inspiring environment. And when we were showing off the Apple one, even at the PC76 show, we had the Apple two design. It was a three month design. It came up very, very quickly, but we were keeping kind of secret about it. As far as Apple one, how did we sell? Steve Jobs didn't get on the phone call at the stores that were opening around the country, and there weren't too many, probably just a couple of dozen cities that had computer stores, and he would tell them what we had and what price, and send them some brochures if they wanted to work business that way. One time, I was driving in Southern California. I popped into a store, I saw, I drove by it, I think I saw the name, I didn't know about it in advance. A computer store in Orange, California. And I walked in, talked to the guy, showed him an Apple One board, and told him what it did, and, and uh, he sat down and he said, well, he was thinking about opening up this display of a whole bunch of Apple Ones playing the game. I showed him playing Star Trek off of tape, cassette tape. And he would set it up, and he, he bought about 20 Apple Ones, and he had all these stations he could come in and rent time and play Star Trek on it, which was a text-based game. And that was the sort of way we made sales back then. So on the same subject, uh, I have to say, one of my most vivid memories in the summer of 76 is when you would show up at the garage and with a new version of Basin, and Steve Jobs would 
read it off the page and he would touch type, like a maniac, just type of typing in the house, which just completely amazed me. I didn't I, Another uh, great design characteristic of the Apple One was the uh, area where you could uh, put in the parts that were uh, identified and you would have an RF modulator, but we weren't allowed to uh, create and sell one of our own, right, because of uh, FCC rules? No, we had no RF modulator built on the board. No, right. The parts you could build in were only for clocking a 6800 style chip that needed better clocks. We wouldn't, when we came out with the Apple II, the other thing that was heard, when we came out with the Apple II, um, you needed a way to get it into your television set, and televisions didn't have video in. I just unscrewed the back of my set with a schematic, probe with an oscilloscope, and found where the video went, built a transistor inverter to get my video into my home TV. But um, the way to get it in would be to broadcast it on a channel, like Channel 3 or Channel 34 or whatever. Some of the early VCRs were um, out, I think, at that time, and that's how they were doing it. But uh, I was a ham radio operator, and we're supposed to protect the purity of the waves, and how do you know what you're allowed to transmit, what you don't, when there's no law? So I wouldn't let Apple build a modulator really against it. And they worked a sneaky agreement behind my back to just funnel this other guy the shipment rates of our Apple IIs and the circuit for, yeah, Marty's Brick Helmet, the M&R Super Mod Modulator to get it on TV sets. Yeah, I was um, just afraid of trans, you know, going, of being one of those guys that puts out waves that disturb. The airways should be clean and pure, so they work well. They work well. I mean, somebody comes out with a product that puts out bad frequencies or, or too much power, really all of the formulas for what makes radio work go downhill. Now, even though the, um, the Apple One was revolutionary in its time because you had the opportunity of buying one assembled and tested by Van Cuffey, and if you wanted a, uh, an alter or an inside, you had to just get the parts and put them together yourself, although some people would uh, sell you the services of assembling it for you, and, and having soldered together a couple of processor technology, 4K by uh, 4 RAM boards, uh, it was certainly worth the money. But uh, even when you got the Apple One uh, assembled and tested, you remember you just got the bare board. There was no case, there was no keyboard, and, well, the, well, there was the power supply circuitry, but you had to supply your own power transformers. You had to go out and buy the two transformers, wire them to 110 yourself, and wire them up to the Molex connector to plug into the board. Um, a lot of people, I on my own, I couldn't find the Molex connector, so I just soldered the uh, leads right to the um, right to the uh, the diodes that were the uh, the full wave rectifier bridge. Uh, on the board, and I, I still remember the smell when I burned out a diode by, by putting it in the back. Uh, those, those things stick with you. Uh, and so, it, putting together the Apple One was, it, it was, you had to go pick up the things in various places, and I remember my first keyboard, uh, Wasendrops gave me the, uh, the bare board and let me populate it myself, but I still needed the keyboard. And I remember getting my first keyboard for my Apple One in the parking lot of the bike shop in Santa Clara, somewhere in, in like the fall of 1976, I was talking with this guy and I had written a couple of programs on the Apple One with, that were demos and he said, uh, okay, uh, you give me that program and I think I got a keyboard in my trunk. So he went out of his car and he opened his trunk and he had an 8-bit ASCII positive going last, not negative going last, so I needed to wire in an inverter on the breadboard area in order to make it work. Um, and then I had my keyboard and then I could use my Apple One. I didn't have any case for it though, but at school there was a cardboard box that I picked up in the computer lab. And so for the rest of that year I carried around my Apple One in a punch card box labeled IBM. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Well, that, that was kind of interesting. Yeah, I mentioned that we, I gave the first Apple One to Liza. Well, Steve and I agreed to both both give, and I didn't have to pay this time, uh, our first Apple II, or one of our first ones, to Chris at Homestead High School, because we had both attended Homestead High School. The subject of the cases, I can remember going to see carpenters with Steve Jobs to look at guys who would make some wooden cases for us, and I remember uh, some guy promoting this great go of wood that he wanted to use to make the cases out of, or teak. Uh, the, the one of the slide, I had never seen that one before. I'm not, I'm not positive, but I believe that was uh, built by my brother when he was unemployed in the summer. And uh, he was just looking for something to do and uh, put uh, several Apple IIs into cases. I know he, he built a, a set of Apple II cases. I don't know if that's one of them. Yeah, I remember my own 
original case for my prototype, hand soldered, hand wired, Apple I and Apple II actually, those cases were wooden ones made by Randy's either father or brother, I guess. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's and Steve Headley at Homestead, who ran the wood shop as well as computer lab, uh, and somewhat interchangeably, uh, he also did some wooden cases for Apple II. And I've always been under the impression that that's one of his, but I didn't know about the brother, so it could very well be that one. Um, so I, I remember Mark went to Homestead sometime in the uh, early 80s and said, have you got old Apple stuff here? And Headley produced, you know, a, a pre-product, a hand-built Apple one and a pre-production Apple II, uh, who whose logic board wasn't even solder mask. It was white, it wasn't green. And said, oh yeah, I've got these around. I mean, somebody brought them in, it was me. Um, and he gave them to Markle, and Markle gave them to the Smithsonian. Cool, let's see. Um, that's Apple one, yeah, it was... Um, what, do you, what do you guys think made Apple the, the success, the breakthrough success? What made Apple the breakthrough success? I think the world was waiting for the right combination of things. Um, I, I think um, the fancifulness had aspect of a computer had come into being, and I think a keyboard helped that, color helped it, games helped it, and also the marketing was probably harder. I think it's a lot easier. I don't want credit for starting uh, the, the whole world on the homebrew computers. I just want the credit for designing a good one. Um, Steve Jobs and Mike Markle really had all the ideas of communicating to the public why a computer can do things for you, that it can be valuable in the home. And yes, it can do your recipe, it can store your recipes, and it can uh, uh, help manage your checkbook and all this. And it's not really so much where the world for personal computers came. What we had, the, the sort of the vision was, this is the product that will do it all, but really it was quite a step, um, you know, other products and other markets that came along really made it as big as it was. But, um, so, uh, you know, it's really fun, but still, publicizing the fact that a computer can look attractive and attract the people in a home and, you know, keeping their home together can actually use a product was a, a big part of it. Yeah, I think uh, I think Steve Jobs had a lot to do with that. I mean, he learned that from Mike Markle and it's sort of keep him doing the same thing, making making technology that's easy for people to use. Because, I mean, Chris, you know, you've heard all these horror stories about how hard it was to build your own computer. That was totally true. I actually built an Apple One, which we never got running, because I was so bad with the soldering iron. Of, I no, I came, wire over, I came over and soldered it. We did get run. But it broke very shortly there. Oh. <laughs> uh, um, but, I mean, it was just so hard to get something working, and uh, Apple was the first one that really sort of packaged it all together where a relatively normal person uh, would be able to get it going. They wouldn't be able to store their recipes on it. We never did that. We did we did checkbook balancing, and yeah. I don't think anyone ever successfully used it other than Mike Markle and myself. Uh -huh. Well, also, this was back in the days when you know, we didn't have, of course, we had hardware that failed. The ships would go bad in the Apple I because you could touch them with the static would zap the processor or some EMOS RAMs, and I didn't have some uh, uh, TTL input pull downs that would cause them to be flaky. But um, the Apple II, the processor is about going to be exactly static. But, um, and the but still, yeah, still, yeah, the keyboard. But we still had basically no hardware or software bugs ever that I heard of for either of those products. So I, I think when you handwrite the code, you are so close to it in your mind all the time, so close to it, there's higher reliability way of developing software. Was there any moments when you guys uh, thought Apple wouldn't make it? All of them. All of them. <laughs> well, uh, but just to backtrack a little bit on that. Uh, uh, this is subject of back in the garage. I, I think the week I arrived in 76, Steve Jobs' father had just built the burn-in box. I had no idea what this was. It was a coffin-shaped box out of uh, plywood that the Apple ones maybe would hold 10 Apple ones, and you would power them up and let them run overnight. And so that was actually one of my first jobs was taking, putting them in, burning them in, and taking them out, adjusting them. And, uh, and then, uh, so, uh, when I finally transitioned from Apple production into Apple engineering in 78, that was my first job in engineering, was to build a modular burn-in rack test system for the Apple II boards. And on the subject of failures, the thing that plagued us at the time was that you would burn in the Apple II boards and the, the little monolithic 0.1 microfarad capacitors would sometimes short out during the burn-in. And the power supply would be shut off, and so the whole boards would get uh, the boards would get burned up. 
and the burning bus. I don't know if you remember that, maybe you never saw that. That was actually the worst failures that, that I ever saw in my year in, in production at Apple. So uh, back to your question, were there times I thought Apple wouldn't make it? Uh, there were two main times I can remember. One was uh, the night that uh, Steve Jobs called everybody that uh, Woz knew and said, you've got to get Steve to do this company. He's, he, he doesn't want to do it. He wants to stay at HP. He wants to move to Corvallis. And uh, you've got you to tell him that you know, doing this company is the right thing. I'm sure you remember that now. Um, and the other is when we were doing the uh, disk drive in uh, Las Vegas and working all night. And in the morning, I backed it up the wrong direction and destroyed um, quite a few hours of work. I think I was the one that backed it up the wrong way. Well, um, yeah, there was also a crime with the Apple II. This is not Apple I related stuff, but um, yeah, the Apple II and uh, our sales went up right away. We started selling them at all the stores after the West Coast Computer Fair introduction. And uh, after a while of time, we started to pile up a bunch of boxes in our one building, our one facility, and people could see, you know, dozens of computers that weren't shipped, weren't sold yet. It, it's like all of a sudden marketing, you know, instead of engineering having, having the, um, the monkey, all of a sudden it was marketing, you had to get to selling them. But around that time, we came out with the floppy disk drive, and VisiCal showed up, and then the world went bananas, and we couldn't keep up with it for quite a long time. Um, yeah, uh, I never really thought Apple wouldn't make it. Now, I did. I felt it was just out of my own integrity. I was going to be myself. I wasn't going to be pushed around, influenced by big business and by money and stuff like that in my life. And I made up my mind. Yeah, I did. I, you know, I had designed two computers, cassette tape interfaces, uh, written all this software. I'd written a basic, done all this stuff, moonlighting from Hewlett Packard. Five turndowns from Hewlett Packard, by the way. And I figured, you know, God, I can just keep doing that when we start Apple. I'll just keep moonlighting, and if it doesn't go, I still got my job for life at HP. And I love designing computers so much and helping the world, you know, get advanced, but I could do that on my own time. So yeah, I did say no to Steve Jobs and Mike Marklet for, for starting the real corporation, the real Apple II, moving out of the garage. Uh, moving into the garage was another ethical consideration. Steve said, why don't we sell some PC ports? And the whole idea wasn't even to have a computer company. It was just to sell components, PC ports. Steve had worked in surplus stores like Caltech and selling parts, you know, buying them cheap and selling them expensive or for, for more. And, um, and that was, <laughs> and so, so it wasn't really like we were even selling computers. Good God, I was passing out the schematics and serving to the Apple One. I'm sure there's no IP violation on these Apple One replicas. Um, they were, you know, we didn't even put uh, copyright notices on them to back at home for computer club days. So, um, um, so anyway, uh, so Steve One didn't really want to start a computer company, but I said, wait, wait First of all, I think anything I design belongs to my company, HP, you know, and um, and I've used their parts, and so I went to HP, and we had a big meeting to do a computer that could run basic, let you type your own programs in, let you type games in, let you type solutions to work, and watch it on your RCA television. And one of the interesting map was, well, Hewlett Packard has to build finely controlled products that are guaranteed to work for engineers who expect professional equipment. Our, our, our only consumer product really was the calculator. And what if the television set didn't show the picture well? Was it the television's problem? Was it Hewlett Packard's problem? Those kind of issues HP did not want to ever get into. They only wanted to deliver 100% reliable, sure working uh, program according to the specs. So they didn't go with the Apple One. When I got an order for, was Steve, Steve Jobs called me up one day and he had an order for $50,000. 100 fully built computers, we'd be paid $500 each from the bike shop. Now that was a shock, because $50,000 was more than twice my annual salary at Hewlett Packard as an engineer. So I went to Hewlett Packard's legal department and made them cycle uh, a description of our product to every single Hewlett Packard division to make sure that I wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't come back and accuse me of doing something wrong, you know, doing something wrong for the sake of money or your own company, something I could never do. And then, um, let's see, what was another? Hewlett Packard eventually started building a computer on my floor of our calculator lab. And it had a microprocessor, and it had some dynamic memory, and it had a little video screen, black and white, and it had a keyboard, a human keyboard, you could type programs in basic. And they had five people assigned for writing the basic, and it had a tape drive, and I'd done cassette tape. All these things I had just done, but I didn't care. I, I went to the, the director, and I said, of the project, and I said, my life isn't calculated. My life has always been about computers. I want to be on this Capricorn project. I'll do anything. I'll do a printer interface. I don't have to do, you know, any major role in it. Or, you know, I want to do it. And they turned me down again for that one. So, but Hewlett Packard, they had bought the Apple into the Apple idea. It never would have happened. 
They never would have done a product that would have inspired normal people. All the people that were outside of the uh, professional engineering industry, all the people that never came around computers, the dentists, the teachers, the lawyers, the, the sort of people that really um, Apple was going to open up the uh, window for. Well, dear listener, if you made it this far, you can pin your nerd star right on your Sneech's belly. We didn't get as far as the famous Captain Crunch's long but interesting piece in the Q&A, but you can find this and everything else on the DigiBarn site at www.digibarn.com. And my introductory slides, more pictures, documents, and the complete video of this event linked from this podcast episode at www.levityzone.org. Thanks to our four panelists, to Vintage Computer Festival founder and producer Salam Ismail, and to Digibarn co-founder Alan Lundell for capturing all of the video and audio of the event. Bo Millward did his usual sterling job of cleaning up the audio as best he could, and theme music for this episode is a 70s disco-tinged electronic beat called Mind Tickle, by Kyle Espenshad. Thanks for taking this deep dive into nerd history and my personal interest in collecting the stories behind the screens. And see you next time in the Levity Zone.